program directors, the Honorable Premier of the Western Cape, Ms. Helen Zilla, the Archbishop, Dr. Tabo Makoba, Mrs. Talata, and the family, members of the Fervurt family, the chairperson of the foundation, Professor Swart. Ladies and gentlemen, I greet you. I was telling people not so long ago <clears throat> that I never know which of my many speeches I'm going to deliver until the time has come. Let me begin anyway. I'm very thankful to both the Talata and the Fervurt families for providing me with books in advance so that I have a sense of what is it that those who suffered for freedom or those whose loved ones suffered for freedom to the point of paying the ultimate price have really been through, and also to appreciate the possibility that no matter how much your forebears might have been consumed by hatred and a false sense of superiority, we are created in a way that allows for any one of us to connect with that loving, caring, and soft being that we have either taught ourselves to undermine or have been groomed to disregard. And your book, uh, Mr. Wilhelm, I thought it was Wilhelm, that's why I'm struggling. Wilhelm Fervurt has really done a lot to help me appreciate that truly it's not late for South Africa to get her act together. I've been led to believe that uh, what is sought to be achieved, and maybe I should read it, <clears throat> is what was read out not so long ago, which is, well, let me read it. We would like the conference to support the mobilization of the South African society to address the root causes, root causes, of our painful pasts in order for us to live in peace with each other. The conference promotes various aspects of restitution, e.g. restitution of land, economic opportunities, health opportunities, education, dignity, memory, etc. The conference promotes restitution that would lead to healing. The conference will look at the reasons why the ideals of the Freedom Charter and the TRC restitution recommendations were not achieved and look at ways to address the hindrances. I was almost brought down to tears when Lucanio explained how at a tender age of about four, I think you were, had to grapple with the notion of losing a father and his continued insistence that he actually saw his father enter a bus. That which they said contained his father did not contain his father. And how he held onto the dress of his mother, the pain, the depression that his mother had to contend with, especially how she broke down during the TRC hearings, how the journalists captured her emotions. 
And I think it's Dr. Alex Borain who also explained how that pain registered on him. Losing his job in a manner that he did for saying we're all equal before the eyes of God. Dismembering him, cutting out his, 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 his fingers in the manner that it was done. Basically bringing untold suffering to bear upon him. Now here is the point. Maybe I shouldn't even reach my, read my speech. I should just make a few remarks and take questions. Why is it that 24 years down the line we gathered in this manner to reflect on restitution and towards a shared future. Why, what have we been doing all this long? What are the fundamentals that explain why the kind of progress we undertook to make as set out in the preamble to our constitution or even in the Freedom Charter, has not been achieved. I think one of those fundamental questions that we must ask ourselves is this. Did apartheid and its tendencies experience sudden death? If it didn't, did it ever die? And if so, at what point? What led to its death? Because I believe that we haven't made much progress because it's, it's a very sensitive issue talking about apartheid, isn't it? It's like you are accusing your fellow countrymen and women. It's like you are accusing them of racism and heartlessness. Therefore, we rather sit back, not rock the boat, and assume that our progressive constitution will somehow find its way into the hearts and minds of South Africans and cause them to automatically become what the constitution says we all ought to be and strive for. I've had occasion to say we've been tap dancing around issues that we needed to confront for far too long. And that is why we're not making progress. And it's not for, it's, we just didn't tap dance. It is dangerous, by the way, to confront issues that are at the heart of our lack of progress. It is dangerous. People die. They didn't just die during the apartheid era. They die whether in South Africa or around the world. And maybe I must rush ahead of myself and, 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 and read a quotation that explains why it's going to be very difficult to realize the objectives that you as the foundation have set yourself to achieve, that we as a nation have set ourselves to achieve, if we are either ignorant of what informs our limited progress or what could frustrate our renewed vigor to get to where we need to be. Let me read that. A man by the name of, why am I forgetting this man? A man has written the book, and the title of the book is The Looting Machine. The name of the man is Tom Burgess. Now he explains that some people in the corporate sector mean well and that some politicians in Africa mean well and some public servants in, in, the, in, the, in, in Africa mean well. But then he, he says the following, open quotes. The looting machine has been modernized where once treaties were signed at gunpoint, dispossessed African inhabitants of their land, gold, and diamonds. Today, phalanxes of lawyers representing oil and mineral companies with annual revenues in the hundreds of billions of dollars impose miserly terms on African governments and employ tax dodges to bleed profit from destitute nations. In the place of the old empires are hidden networks of multinationals 
middlemen, and African pot potentates. These networks fuse state and corporate power. They are aligned to no nation and belong instead to the transnational elites that have flourished in the area of globalization. Above all, they serve their own enrichment closely. We know, and anybody who cares to know, must be aware by now that this, is, this has been exposed by many people. One called me last night, uh, Dr. Rodney Howard Brown, a South African based in America. He released a book this year, The Killing of Uncle Sam, which tells you who actually runs the economy of the world, who actually runs the governments of the world, who actually declares war and for what purpose? Why is it that we don't have peace around the world? Until we confront this reality, we will outline all the good objectives that need to be realized, but no progress will ever be made because you don't just control or enjoy that much power and not look at owning machineries through which you can determine what people hear, a machinery that will facilitate manipulation of narratives that go out there so that they can condemn everybody else but not you. The new confessions of uh, the economic hitman outlines that too. We know these things. So, how have we grappled with the fundamentals behind that which informed the death of Fort Talata? What did he die for? And what have we as a nation done to make sure that he didn't die in vain? What plan is there to make sure that e economic opportunities that are mentioned in the Freedom Charter and even in our Constitution, are truly available to all. Where is the plan? Why is it difficult to make sure that there is employment equity in South Africa? Why? I was saying to some meeting, you don't even need the Employment Equity Act. You don't need any law to do the right thing if you are committed to it. You don't need all these amendments and everything else if you are committed to restitution. If it is in the heart, that is the best constitution you can ever ask for. That is the best law you can ever ask for. But why is there no change? Why is it difficult for South Africans to come together and say, you know what? We've been a mockery for far too long. We've been persecuting each other for far too long. We are one big family. Our color, our gender ought to make no difference. Let's sit together. Let's sit together, typical of 70 uh, family members, and give it to each other. Tell me what wrong I have done. Let me tell you what wrong we have done as a family and let's find a solution together. Let's stop enjoying a scenario where we are successfully and skillfully able to locate blame in one area and one area only. What am I saying? We're all to blame. But, we are to blame because we have allowed ourselves to be manipulated. That is the first starting point. The truth of the matter is not as many women and black people participate meaningfully in the mainstream economy. It's true. Why? And where is the plan? Is there resistance or do we work together as a nation to make sure that the ideals that Fort Talata and others died for become realizable. Because if there is no plan and no commitment to the plan, ah, we will be having this meeting in, uh, in 20, 2050. In 20, is there 2080? 
2018, and nothing much would have been achieved. So, a meeting like this is not so much an intellectual exercise as it is a place where well-meaning South Africans ought to come together and indulge in a very brutal self-introspection. It is not a meeting where we have interests, vested interests to protect, but it's a meeting where, like Wilhelm Verwurt, we sit back and say, truly, as a white man, I've benefited from the apartheid system. I'm not evil. My grandfather was not evil. He just had a particular world outlook. How do we address the problem without making anybody feel guilty? How do we address the problem without making anybody feel evil? How do we reach out to one another in a constructive way? How do we ensure that no black person thinks that he or she is entitled just to have without working. How do we get to that point where we realize that we all have the responsibility to work towards the economic development of South Africa, to work towards peace and stability in our country? I said I'll say something and then uh, take questions because I think that's more effective. Where to from here? The beginning, I think, is networking, such as you are doing now. And please don't misunderstand me. I like giving this example and caution that people should not uh, misunderstand me. But I think there is a lesson to be drawn from what the Afrikaner Bruder Bond did. Setting up a think tank of intellectuals to say, oh, we Afrikaners believe that we have been oppressed and nobody is going to take us out of this oppression, we bear the responsibility to do it ourselves. So who of our people have the technical know-how to make sure that as regards the economy, as regards governance, as, it, as regards education, agriculture, whatever else, we have a blueprint through which we can take ourselves out of where we are. So what am I saying? I'm not saying join the African Bruder Bond. I'm saying establish think tanks wherever you are. Think tanks that will examine very critically. Political scientists can do that. Whoever else can look at another thing. Why should our education system allow 30% to be a pass mark? All those things. The quality of the, education, uh, of the educational system that we have as well. And come up with solutions, but it doesn't end there. Implementation is a critical part of achieving that which we set ourselves to achieve. Identify people with a track record of causing things to happen. And once you've done that, then you release responsibilities to them to do it. So in every, wherever you, in every sphere of influence where you find yourself, find a group of friends. Be as worried as Fort Talata and others were. Remember what they did? Small cells where discussions about critical issues, including whether to establish a crash or not, were to happen. How to empower those in the community economically. How to cripple the economy if they think that the economy doesn't serve them through boycotts and whatever else. Those small cells, which mean no evil, but are designed to help us march forward as a united and reconciled South Africa. It's what we need. Two, we need, for instance, to deal with the land issue very soberly. Very soberly. I know it's a very emotive issue, but it is people who are gathered here and others elsewhere who can gather as we have, who have what it takes to say, you know, this land issue, this land restitution issue can actually be dealt with in a way that leaves all South Africans happy with the solution. How did we become a constitutional democracy? Compromise. As long as none of us wants it all, as long as the love that I found mentioned in the Freedom Charter, by the way, the education system that teaches people to love their people and to love their country, as long as you are driven by love for another human being, black or white, 
Then you'll say, we don't want to destroy this country. We've seen other countries destroyed by wars. Syria is one of them and many others. What is it that we can do to avert destroying one another because of land or economic opportunities? We have it here. I'm confident that there is nothing good that South Africans are determined to do that they can't do. Remember how impossible it appeared to be when the negotiations that resulted in the constitutional democracy that we are began, it looked like a joke. It looked like a hopeless situation. But here we are. What is it that we can do? Even the World Cup, remember? It looked like something be way beyond our capabilities. But it happened, and happened well. So let's pour our energies, our intellect, into finding a solution about the land issue, the economic issue, the educational system, any other thing, in a way that is acceptable to everybody. Persuas Let's believe in our capacity to persuade others to do what will be, not for my good, but for the good of us all. We've got amazing experts in the agricultural sector in South Africa. We need to retain that that uh, expertise without compromising principle. Anybody who goes to the farmers and gives them false hope is postponing the solution. Speak to them lovingly, say, let us talk until we agree. I've had several meetings with people in the agricultural sector, and I realized that all they want is somebody who will listen to them. They are different. The overwhelming majority of landowners in this country are ready to talk to find a solution. They are willing to sacrifice where sacrifice is required within reason. Why can't we do that? Why are we more in the public domain making statements that could tear us apart than statements that can bring us together as one big South African family? That should be our focus. But greed in all its permutations is driving us apart. We all talk about inequality, the gap between the poor and the rich, and especially those who are, in the, who are rich. They've got all sorts of concepts about it. A person earns what? As much as five million per month? Is the one talking about uh, like the widening gap between the, the poor and the rich. Am I, against, am I against the rich? No. But what is it? that you have done differently as an employer of a domestic worker in your home, as an employer of labor in the mining industry, in the manufacturing industry to lessen the gap? Is there, are we doing business with a conscience or is it all about money, an insatiable appetite for wealth? Because once you have that appetite for wealth, Life doesn't matter. That is why the environment is not respected by some of those who do business. They don't care about the toxicity, and I say some, advisedly. People die. People develop diseases. The environment gets destroyed. As long as money is flowing in, in its volumes, it's okay. And you dare not raise a finger. You'll be dealt with. So, We've got to decide whether we want to be popular. We want to be affirmed. And to say things that will ensure that you enjoy coverage and praise. Or whether like Fort Talata and Valhalla, who chose to speak against the, the wishes, the well-known wishes of his own father at Stellenbosch University. When the accounting, uh, account is it the accountancy department was doing what it was doing? Are you willing to be like them and say, for the sake of my conscience, for the sake of my country, I'm going to sacrifice whatever needs to be sacrificed so that South Africa can be as good as we say we want it to be? Injustice is unsustainable. It's never going to help you to 
modernize it over and over again. We have all been bestowed with a measure of wisdom, and at some point, we are bound to see through the shenanigans that are designed to mislead us into believing that we are for progress when, in fact, we are not. You know, Luca Nyotalata and his wife say something um, that comes from, uh, they actually quote uh, Dr. Alan Busak, where he said to white people at the time, we, we don't want your hearts. It's not enough to say my heart is with you. We want your warm bodies to be with us as we soldier on. But he also makes another important point. The visit by Uom Beyes Nodie to Kredok at the time when it was on fire. How the people of Kredok demonstrated their openness to any South African who wants to build the South Africa that we can all enjoy. As if it was at the funeral, actually. When Dr. Buzak came in, they grabbed Uombe, lifted him up. They didn't see him as a white person. They saw him as a fellow South African. That should be our attitude. So just how committed have we been? And just how committed are we to what we say needs to be done and to what we say we, 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 we are doing? Racism is one of the problems. Let's start at home teaching our children right, our grandchildren, kindergarten, primary school. Let's develop sub solutions that can be disseminated at that level. The church seems to have abandoned its responsibility. Arch, the church has a critical role to play in healing or helping South Africans to heal. I see quite often we align ourselves with this political party or the other, openly condemning that or the other individual. We need to do much more than that quietly and behind the scenes, as the Desmond Tutus of this world, the Ersnodias of this world did during their time. There's a lot of healing that the church can help us realize, but also integrity. We've got to insist on being led by men and women of integrity because anybody can claim to be a person of integrity. When in fact, that is why everybody is speaking against corruption. Even the corrupt people are masters of how to speak against corruption. So what is it that we must do to ensure that those who govern us are truly people of integrity? I was saying to some group not so long ago, I wonder why I had to be interviewed for two days to become chief justice. And all that some have to do is go to a stadium or town hall and make a speech, no question, and run away. You don't even know who wrote the speech. I think we've got to make sure, whether you become a minister, a premier, some interrogation system similar to that of America, similar, not identical, must happen. What do you know for you to become minister? What competencies are there? Will you be able to deliver? Those are some of the things that are needed now so that Lucanio does not ask the, quest, the kind of difficult questions that he had to put to a particular deputy minister in relation to why proper work is not being done to ensure that those responsible for the killing of his father are brought to justice. Let us renew our commitment to justice. Let us do more and say less. Now, I think I am done. The media finally have a critical role to play in this regard. Just reflect on, as reflected in the book, Zuela Kesusulu did, which resulted in the last inquiry that was held before the judge president of the Eastern Cape and what that journalist from the Herald did, whose role was subsequently terminated because of her commitment 
to objectivity and fair reporting. Let us just make sure that we do what the media is about. None of us is committed to any agenda other than that agenda that ensures that everybody is treated fairly, objectively. We're not pushing anybody's agenda at the expense of others. We're not silencing other people, however well-meaning they might be, because we are somehow aligned to other people. I say this advisedly because I know that around the world there are media houses that are owned by certain individuals with a very clear objective of pushing a particular agenda. It is true. If you want to engage me on that, I'm available and I can tell you. I think I'll stop here, ladies and gentlemen, and open myself up to questions if it's in line with your system.